The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, length, depth, and width, platonic forms get together and turn up their nose at the platonic form of wobbliness, forcing the poor rejected archetype to seek out bad company with chaos and bedlam and turmoil and form a prog rock band. Wobbliness plays a mean to Giridu, by the way. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword, all right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Senior Editor Tony Daniel. We have part one of a two-part interview with John Ringo and Mike Massa this time, talking about their new entry in the Black Tide Rising series. The book is called River of Night. This one is the follow-up to the Valley of the Shadows, which turned our attention from Steve Smith and his daughters in the original few books of the series, now to Tom Smith, Steve's brother, and his cohorts who are dealing with the zombie apocalypse in New York and now across the eastern U.S. In this one, Tom and his forces escape from New York and are headed for Site Blue. Uh, it's in West Virginia and ultimately the Tennessee River TVA dams where there's a chance to restart civilization. But along the way, the group faces stiff resistance from rogue humans as well as zombie hordes. It's a really riveting account of a quest through chaos with some very cool heroes facing very stiff odds. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Larry Correa's great high fantasy novel, Son of the Black Sword. Now here's the news. The July mass market paperbacks are now at booksellers everywhere. These include Monster Hunter Memoirs, Saints, by Larry Correa and John Ringo. There's a larval great old one growing in power day by day under the city of New Orleans. If Chad Gardner can't convince the powers that be to get involved, the entire world is going to fall under the power of this nastiest of nasties. Also out in mass market is Avalanche, book five of The Secret World Chronicle by Mercedes Lackey, Cody Martin, Dennis Lee, and Veronica Giger. Ultima Thule has been destroyed, but somehow the Thulians mounted an even bigger force to destroy the Medes, the superhero-like main characters of the series, and it's up to the heroes of Echo and CCCP to save the world. The avalanche has begun. And finally out in mass market in July is A Fistful of Elven Gold by Alex Stewart. When war erupts, the fate of a kingdom rests in the hands of a bounty-hunting gnome. If only he could decide which side to take. A Fistful of Elven Gold by Alex Stewart. Avalanche, Book 5 of The Secret World Chronicle by Mercedes Lackey, Cody Martin, Dennis Lee, and, and Veronica Giguere. And Monster Hunter Memoir Saints by Larry Correa and John Ringo are now available at booksellers everywhere as mass market paperbacks. And hey, when a book comes out in mass market, the ebook prices go down. So check these out. This is part one of a two-part interview with John Ringo and Mike Massa, authors of River of Night. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. I want to welcome John Ringo and Mike Massa back to the podcast. Hi, how's it going, guys? Hey, we actually both made it this time. And I've got a fresh cup of coffee, so I'm good. <laughs> hey, Tony. Hey, John. Glad to be here. I got my Diet Coke lined up. Very excellent, very excellent. Okay. Well, uh, John, let, let me just uh, talk a little bit about your all's backgrounds. Um, John Ringo brings fighting to life, as we say in the bio um, on uh, River of Night. He is the New York Times, and it's true. He is the New York Times bestselling author of the Legacy of the Aldenata series, the Paladin of Shadow series, the Special Circumstances series, and Looking Glass series, uh, probably a couple other series in there that uh, we could mention. John has co-authored four novels in the Empire Man series, also with um, New York Times bestselling author David Weber, and is the co-author of three novels in Larry Correa's bestselling Monster Hunter International series, the Monster Hunter Memoir novels, um, which uh, one of the mass markets on that is, I think the final one is out this month as well, um, which is... 
what? Uh, it's the New Orleans one, right? Yeah. That's one of the two New Orleans. John Science Space Zombie Apocalypse Black Tade Rising series it includes Under a Graveyard Sky, To Sail a Darkling Sea, Islands of Rage and Hope, Strands of Sorrow, and The Valley of Shadows, co-authored with Mike Massa, um, as well as story anthology Black Tide Rising, co-edited with Gary Poole. He's a veteran of the 82nd Airborne and lives in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Mike Massa has lived a diverse and adventurous life, including stints as a Navy SEAL officer. I thought you were you were an officer, huh? Yeah, I was. I was. Oh, okay. Just poke. <laughs> right. Well, that's too bad. Anyway, an international investment banker and internet uh, technologist, which is what he does now. He counts his greatest adventure, well, in addition to being a, an excellent writer, um, he counts his greatest adventures as marriage and parenthood. Massa is currently a university cyber security researcher consulted by governments, Fortune 500 companies, and net and high net worth families on issues of privacy, resilience, and disaster recovery. He lives he lived outside the U.S. for many years, plus military deployments, and has traveled to over 80 country countries. My, uh, Mike lives in Virginia. Um, and out now at booksellers everywhere is the sequel to The Valley of Shadows, which is called The River of Night. And uh, right now it is the number one best-selling science fiction hardcover in America. So congratulations on that, guys. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. I'm very excited. Yeah, yeah it's good. I, I mean, I've, I've written a lot of stuff, but uh, now that's on BookScan, which is called the Nielsen Book. Um, and since BookScan has come out, I have had three books be number one that were novels. Um, the last, uh, missed one of the anthologies in this, in the shared world. Voice of the Fall was actually a uh, number one hardcover of Book of the Fall. Um, but it's uh, it's pretty hard to get number one hard cover. Yeah, it's very excellent, um, and and it's a damn good book, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm often I often tout books that I think are pretty good, but this one I was like, wow, this is kind of riveting. Um, when somebody says you can't put it down, this one uh, really really uh, fits that bill. When you've written a whole bunch of books. Halfway through the book, you're already thinking about the next story. Um, <laughs> and uh, so by the time a book actually comes out, we turn this in. Mike, when, when, when did River of Night finally get started? We were working on it oh. January yeah, of I think, 2018. Yeah, we turned this in, I want to say in January, February. But I have to go back and check my notes. But... But when we were really working on it, it was like a year before that, right? I mean, when we were at CBC and we decided to split it up, that was like January of 2018. Yeah, that was yeah, that was quite a while. That that was obviously before Valley of Shadow went into editing, so it had to be that it had to be that long ago at least. Yeah. So when we were really working hard on this, it was like a year and a half. Um, <laughs> so some of these questions, I I'm like. Well, I remember who that character was. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I understand. Um, maybe you could, uh, but uh, maybe you could set up the world a little bit, um, because uh, what is it's about H seven D three, right? H um, seven D three is the virus which was uh, uh, it was a genetically programmed virus that was designed to create a twenty eight days later type zombie virus. Um, a zombie environment where people would be insane and violent and go around attacking. Um, it's kind of a bizarre virus in that it spreads both uh, in an airborne fashion and also in the blood path. Um, and uh, there isn't, there are a couple of pathogens out there that sort of do it, but not the way that it does it. Um, and after the first book came out, I got word back that uh, some of the people, some of the senior epidemiologists, epidemiological people at CDC took a look at it and kind of went, oh, hell, because they were looking at it and going, yeah, um, 
forget this being something, uh, you know, might possibly occur at some point in the future, especially under the technology now. So, uh, <laughs> so came up with with a new idea. call uh, Rob Hampson and conference him in and see if he can tell us. <laughs> H73 was, although it's, you know, it's a very serious book and everything else, I actually created it as calling it H73 was specifically kind of a joke. And it's, God, it's such a nerdy joke. Okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what, um, what, is it, what does it do? Um, yeah, in the uh, context of the book, what, what why is it, uh, I mean, I know, but go ahead and tell us again. Yeah. If you catch it as a flu, um, uh, what it does is it, it goes through an initial flu stage and it spreads. And then after the initial flu stage, the, it produces a secondary pathogen, which essentially shuts down uh, higher thought processes, in, increases progression, causes uh, uh, itching in some skin. Um, which makes people strip off his clothes. One of my problems has always been traditional zombie movie books, uh, or this type of biological zombie movie book, not to go off the head, is that biological process will continue, and modern clothing is very tough. And so if people have clothing on, I can understand why they do it in movies, because you don't want to have a whole bunch of people in there. But the reality is that if uh, people who have lost all capability to go through the kind of complex process, go through get dump, don't take their clothes off, they're gonna get reckless packages. So they strip their clothes off and they get wildly violent and they go around attacking people and chewing on them and all this sort of ghoulish zombie. Um, and in the first book, the first part of the first book, the fall in the under of the sky, you see the fall in New York, it's where you know, it's totally normal people who are totally rational very rapidly become irrational and then strip their clothes off and then attack people and kill them. Um, and so the first book in this sort of spin off series, Valley of Shadows, overlaps New York version portion of Under a Graveyard Scott. Um, and Essentially expands that from the point of view of one of the secondary characters, um, who is the head of who is the head of security for a big bank, and it was the brother of the original main character of the series, Tom uh, Steve Smith, 
um, who is the father of the family of mom and dad girl who becomes the main character. Tom Smith is a major character in this book. First half of the first book disappears. The idea was, okay, what has to happen? Yeah. So we did Valley of Shadows, very much an overlap on the first book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and River, Night, River of Night covers what happens that Mary Van Steve as they kid is on to towards where the an area a place that they are looking for the hope um, and the problem so does that cover the whole book? What is as far as uh Tom and Steve's background, um they're Australian, right? Originally. Why are they in the U.S. and and what makes them so good at at surviving the zombie apocalypse? Well, there's a couple of things. One of the things is never executed. Um, Tom and Steve Smith are the twin sons of a manager, or not the twin, two sons of and the only two children of a manager of Australia Sheep Mission, which is located on the coast. Um, Vaguely near Perth, Australia. Uh, it's actually on the intersection of the Seventy in where it's located, or near that. Um, so they were they were raised uh, as as farm uh, as sheep ranching. And but the thing was that their dad managed the station, but that wasn't something he didn't own. Um, so it wasn't something. And it, by the way, a station is the Australian term for a ring. Um, and so there was no guarantee that they were going to be able to take it. Uh, so both of them joined the Australian. Tom Smith, uh, the eldest, joined the, uh, uh, both of them joined the Australian Army. Tom Smith went on to become a member of the Australian FAS. Uh, Steve Smith joined the army, and he did. Tom Smith, if I remember correctly, went as an officer. Steve Smith went with, and he spent one tour as a member of the Australian Parachute or Para. Um, uh, Steve then got out, got his degree in history, and met and married Stacy Sonnerberg who was an American in Australia. And the decision at some point was made, don't ask me why, moved to the United States and uh, and Steve then became high school. Um, one of the he and Stacey, Steve and Stacey shared uh, an understanding that the world is not always perfect. That the civil existence complex civilization we have built up uh, is robust in some ways but it's also very, very fragile. And so they were always prepared for not so much the complete collapse of civilization but first prepared. They were prepared for the all the issues that come along. I mean, they're the sort of people that see these as well. They don't really have to do anything for them. They don't come through or okay. The Smiths were prepared. They always had toilet issues generator as well as food. Um, but they also had all of these plans that really went for a lot. Um, Tom Smith in the meantime had done his time in SAS and uh, uh, Mike actually built a career for him having to do with that work uh, professional security private military contract. Um, unlike his younger brother he never did. Um, and uh and so he has built his career until he's now chief of security for uh major national bank, which is called to give you an idea. Um and I I wrote I wrote the first four books and I wrote extensively in Ellie Shadows for Night. Is it Bank of the Americas, Mike? Is that is that what I called it? Yep. Mike is there, yeah. Did I call it Bank of the Yep, Americas? absolutely. Okay. That's it. That's it. 
um, because they didn't want to have an actual you know, that, that covered with the fence. Um, but these guys are, uh, they're farmers. I mean, they're, they're ranch hands. They were raised ranch hands. Um, they were raised around guns. They were raised shooting, shooting and trapping these guys. Um, and, and then they got a polish of Tom Smith went forth though in working in the military. So they're, they, they've got, they've got these sort of embedded skills that come out. The other thing about it is they were raised coast. Their house was very, very close to the coast by one of those enormous Australian beaches. And so they grew up swimming, fishing, diving, which comes in handy in both the original form book and also a particular river of night. Because at a certain point, one of them, uh, at a certain point, Tom Smith ends up in the river. It's a very bad situation. That's a great uh, moment. He has to think through all these these you put him in the absolute worst possible uh predicament there's a there's a thing in writing about uh do the worst possible thing you can to your character and i'll say and i'll just go ahead and give it away short of killing because at a certain point you're not sure if he's going to die. um and uh so there is a book called when eight bells toll uh have either of you ever read it? Uh, Alistair McLean, the guy that wrote uh, Guns and Navarone. You no, I've read, read a couple of his, but not that one. Uh, well, Mike, you would love When Eight Bells Hole. Uh, but Alistair McLean in his book, I had eventually, I eventually read like six or seven Alistair McLean and liked all of them so much that I decided to sit down and read absolutely no. I, I was an Alistair that's an Alistair McLean collection. The only, that Tarzan is the only thing I've ever been in collection. Um, so I eventually read every single Alistair McLean book, including The Black Shrike, which is not only fairly hard to find, there's a reason it's fairly hard to find, because, oh my God, it's so fucking awful. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Uh, but everybody has one. Um, or more. Uh, but... When Eight Bells Toll is probably the best of all. Uh, he had a very consistent pattern of you would have a slender, uh, a slender sort of wiry, smart, tall guy as a leader, and then you would have a really massive, strong dude who also was very smart, was like, uh, the one that you guys might know of is Guns of Navarone. You had Mallory and Stubborn. Um, and that was, Mallory was actually based on Thread and Hill. Um, sure. but, uh, in, and he did that in several books. And when, and the, you find at certain points why the wiry, skinny, smart guy is in charge. Because he, he's that much more tactical. Uh, he's the guy that absolutely figure it out, even though his sidekick really was really good to do and really was really capable. Um, but at a certain point, anyway, he has this several different books. He has uh, Mallory and Stavros, two different books. And so it's a trope that he writes that there's this, and, but every now and again, it's got to be the sidekick, it's the big, strong, powerful, extremely dangerous guy that pulls everything out. So in when eight bells toll, like in the third chapter, that guy gets killed. And so the wiry guy, uh the, the leader guy, uh is is left on his own. And his friends in many, many years, they have shared many adventures, saved each other's lives dead. That's a handsome bad guy. And after that, he's looking for a sunken ship which something on it. I think it was gold. And the people that deliberately sunk the ship steal the gold, blah, blah. And so he's up in a Royal Navy helicopter and he gets shot down. And he ends up in the North Sea in a crashed helicopter like 30 fathom, 50 fathom down um, in this compressed ball of air, running out of air in 
freezing cold water that's going to make him hypothermic. And so it's like he's in an impossible situation. And it's literally one of those things that can take his character to the worst possible situation. His best friend, you know, his best friend and buddy is dead. He's at the bottom of the North Sea. He's screwed. And of course he comes back. Um, so I was, I was deliberately thinking about that when I had Tom Smith take the plunge. I, I was mm-hmm. thinking about that moment because, um, you know, I don't want to give away too much about the book, but, uh, a, a major character from Under Graveyard Sky and from Valley of Shadows died, uh, in the book. So, uh, Tom Smith has had one of the rocks depends on taken away from him. And now he is in an impossible situation and has to be out. Um, and, yeah, and at the same time, it was so terrible, we almost had to include him. I, actually, we did. He included him. Yeah, we did. He's like, yeah. I mean, he's like, well, I'm screwed. <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm just going to follow the process. You know, I understand what to do in this situation, so I am just going to follow the process, even though, well, I'm fucking dead. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sorry. But, and he would have died if it hadn't been for Frederica. It was Frederica that he is. <laughs> yeah, that's a wonderful moment, and we probably shouldn't say who or what Frederica is, but... Um, if you know anything about the Tennessee River, you might you might know it's authentic. Just understand, she's got big lips. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of a Tennessee thing, but sure, I'll go with the river thing. Yeah. Well, uh, so let's talk a little bit about the book um, in uh, in as in terms of characters. Um, so we have Tom. Uh, he is he's leading this group across the eastern U. I guess he's going through Pennsylvania to West Virginia and then down. That's the plan, at least, right? And why is he doing this, and what's the purpose of of it? Uh, John, should I take that this one? Did it? I thought he came across from Virginia. He did. Yeah. yeah so the uh, the across- notion is that Tom. During the during the fall, which didn't happen all at once, uh, Tom was responsible for establishing a plan for his bank, as other big organizations did for their corporations and their their business interests. How are we going to survive this? How do we come back from this? And so he established four long term uh, refuges where his his key staff and some of their families could tie it over in a position of relative safety until the rule of law was reestablished and infrastructure came back to a point where it was safe to be in a major city or even a, a medium-sized city again. And one of those four sites, called Site Blue, for, um, for the Blue Ridge Mountains, is located in the Cumberland Valley, the southern, edge, the southern end of the Cumberland Valley, which runs sort of northeast to southwest, uh, the latter part running through the southern part of Tennessee. And so when he escapes New York, as readers of the Valley of Shadow will recall, they run their boat south, fuel up a little bit, run further south, and they make it to a, uh, a hastily prepared uh, safe house. And safe doesn't mean you're actually safe there. It stands for the acronym Selected Area for Evasion. I borrowed from my, uh, my training and my practice when I was on active duty. And when, they, when, when pilots get shot down, they're trained to go look for the safe. Again, not where you're safe, but where you're going to try to evade because the conditions are favorable or the least unfavorable in this case for intermediate uh, duration survival. Right. That it's in it's in North Norfolk, right? It's where it is. Up, up the Charles River, and uh, and they hide out what amounts to a a sort of a um, a cabin, if you will well off the main road, well away from the main drag, like the 264 uh, and the main drag in and out of Newport News from uh, from Richmond, because uh, that's a major corridor. And having traveled that during a con weekend, it's just two lanes in and two lanes out. One person gets a flat tire, everybody stops. So any you know, that kind of region is going to mean you can't travel, you shouldn't be trying to travel when everybody else is still trying to get out. And by the time the immediate carnage has largely subsided, for lack of available targets, 
um, those roads are going to be wholly impassable. So the rate of travel, this is a key factor throughout the book, the rate of travel to go just a few hundred miles, it goes from hours, what we would expect now, or you know, a day in heavy traffic on the 95, it goes to weeks or even longer because you're going to be backtracking constantly. You're not going to have the benefit of GPS and real-time intelligence on where the bad traffic is. Uh, you may not have paper maps. You may run into resistance. You may run into other survivors that don't trust you or won't trust you. And so these guys have to make their way from the coast inland in more or less a straight line overall, but very much backing and filling two steps forward, one step back to make it to this area called this, this base, if you will, called Site Blue. And uh, I'm not going to give a whole lot away, but along the way, not only do they have uh, what I'll call loosely adventures, but uh, they have flat out obstacles that they have to surmount or go around or retreat from. The, I mean, we could talk a little bit about it because some of it's in the descriptive copy <laughs> on, on the uh, – there is um, – although the zombies are a problem um, – some of the worst things that they're going to run into are um, the people who have survived and are or are, are organizing in a in a unfriendly way. Yeah. So in my in my imagination and uh, and in concert with John, iding together and then putting together some scenarios. You know, we really you know there's a really famous um, big name TV show that I won't name um, that we're not really fond of because they constantly require the the person who's watching the show to accept that these survivors who have somehow made it through all these problems are still getting on be, despite their crazy illogical incompetent choices and so i realized hey, anybody that makes it for the first two or three months whether they're a good guy or a bad guy they're going to be more than borderline competent they're going to be flat out competent and in this case um uh smith and his crew run into a group which is both competent and organized and not altruistic. And that's how we meet uh, the first of our really serious bad guys. His name is Harlan Green. And, and Harlan is, uh, is very, much, um, very much the villain of the story. He's not an antihero. But he, he's not just being casually cruel, although he's capable of cruelty, and in, and in fact, enjoying it, but he has a plan, and he really believes that his plan in the long run isn't just better for him, and he's going to make damn sure that it is. It's more or less better for everybody that's survived so far. It's not going to be a democracy, and that's okay. Maybe democracy is a flawed approach, or a republic, if you will, is a flawed approach. But he's not going to copy those mistakes. And he's been surviving on the ground for three and a half months by the time he runs into Smith. Smith and his crew have been hiding in a cabin for three and a half months. So who's going to know conditions better? Who's going to have a larger force? Who's going to be more mobile? Well, it's probably not going to be Smith. So we, you know, it's an early example of John and I placing our uh, protagonist, one of our POV characters, in a really untenable situation, and how do you deal with it? Yeah. Well, Green has – tell us a little bit about this – the methodology he used, which is kind of sick and at the same time highly effective um, to put together his gleaners who are really, they're more like looting killer rapists, but anyway. Well, yeah, so he, he starts, you know, when the, when the, uh, the, when the fire first strikes, uh, Green, who's hyper intelligent and capable and has a background in hacking and entrepreneurial finance and, and some freelance not-so-legal stuff, uh, he realizes really early that it's not happenstance, that it's an attack. And because he's an excellent analyst, he figures out very early what major newspapers take a long time to realize and report, which is this isn't just an attack. This isn't a successful attack that just hasn't finished running its course yet. So if I want to survive, I'm going to have to do things like get myself some vaccine and put together a crew. But it can't be any old crew. I got to find the right people. They got to be right. And so he goes through a, and I won't bog us down in detail unless you ask. I'm happy to go deeper. But he figures out how to recruit uh, actual convicts by looking, using his uh, technolo- tech skills, his computer skills, to search for the profile of incarcerated convicts that he can use. And then, much the same way 
uh, that uh, in the movie um, The Dark Knight, when the Joker has his his uh, auditions, if you will, he says, oh, there's three of you, huh? Well, here's, here's three weapons, and I'm going to recruit you onto my team, but I've only got one spot. You guys figure it out. Winner take all. And that's sort of his approach. So not only does he get a hardened con, but he gets a committed con who's also very capable and sort of man or a woman of their hands, which is what he needs at first. And that's going to be a problem for Green later on because while you need thugs initially because you need shock and awe and violence and a strong stomach, eventually you've got to build a civilization. And so later on he realizes that and he tries to shift his recruiting a bit, which becomes interesting for a character um, that uh, fans of John's series will recognize from the very first book, Under a Graveyard Sky, uh, a police officer named Jason Young. Um, yeah, and if I can... Uh... Do it. Do it. Digress real quick. Um, it's it's not really a digress. It's more or less about the writing process, if you will. Uh, I had uh, previously envisioned a completely different global disaster, which involves pairing. Um, and I actually ran through that scenario an awful lot. And unfortunately, it was just so god awful grim that I decided. Uh, I, I could not figure out a way for there to be anything particularly positive about it at all. Um, so, but in that, I at one point had a character who had very, very quickly looked at the situation. And a Carrington event is a is solar flare it's called a, a coronal mass ejection. And if it hits the Earth, if a massive solar flare hits the Earth at a particular angle, what it essentially does is it breaks the electromagnetic magnetic field. And the electromagnetic field sort of does this like a like a swing back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. This creates enormous what's called ground induction current on anything which is a conductor, any metal conductor. And so what you have is huge electrical surges through your primary power. Uh, the last time it happened was in 1856 or 59. Um, and back then, the only thing you had was telegraph and in, in terms of electronic technology. And they had to disconnect the batteries from the telegraph because the telegraph were overheating and sending these tremendous charges uh, through the telegraph. So they just ran the telegraphs without any battery whatsoever. So one of the places Tesla probably got the idea that you could just draw electricity out of the air. Um, but the, the transcontinental railroad welded in place. There was so much electricity. Well, if that hit us now, um, people are like, you know, if we got hit by a Carrington event, it would be 18 months before they could fix the trans, uh, transform to get them back up. Well, to fix the transforms, you have to have transform. And it will blow out every primary trans, transformer in the world. So we will have no electric power. Uh, we will have no cell phone. Forget internet. I mean, everything will be thoroughly thrashed. At which point, civilization just collapses. Uh, famine hits very, very uh, There's no light. There's no power. There's no food. There's no water. Uh, so I, I started to write this book, and or I, I, I ideated this many, many times. I thought about it. And there was no way for me to do it other than very grim. And some of the places that I went were really gone off. And one of them was a character that I never named. He was just called the White Hand, Sorrow. And he was, he was the guy who looked at the situation and went, you know what? Um, the problem is too much people, too many people. And so in this very atechnological environment, he set up a death camp. Uh, that was designed to catch refugees and slaughter them at mass. Um, and a certain amount of hands wave you about being able to actually do that. But he had to be just got off. Because this whole thing is, we've got to kill as many people as possible. And that was not how he prayed. It was just about looting and the rape and killing. No. But he was actually, from his perspective, uh, in one of the ideations, I had him actually write like a, a note for posterity saying, I'm not going to tell you who I am. I'm not going to tell you what my name is. 
but this is not the person that I was. I looked at the situation clearly, and the only choice was to kill as many people as possible. If, if the rest of the civilization had any chance, it was not um, So, I mentioned that to Mike, talked about it a little bit. I don't know if you remember. Um, but uh, we talked about it a little bit. And so that was the basis, the original basis of Harlan Green. So Harlan Green is both a really nasty bad guy and at a certain level. And in the book, I didn't really get it that clearly. But at a certain level, he's not necessarily the worst of all possible things because from his perspective, it's about, okay, i got to be really nasty right now. Maybe we can back off later on. And the original character, he was like, at a certain point, I'm just going to betray everybody, make sure that they all die. And I'm either going to commit suicide or suicide. <laughs> um, well, that's pretty grim. Harley Green is a really nasty guy. He really, really is. Uh, um, and he is more, well, his background is being a Anyway. I mean, he retains that uh, that characteristic of thinking that he is acting as a sort of a force of nature that ha- is doing what needs to be done, though, right? Right. He does, and and he oh. he's really good at disassembling everybody else's rationalizations and pointing out you you, know, you rationalize. I was taking it a few steps further. What makes me wrong and you right? Yeah, well, I like it when this bullshit's finally called, but that's not. We won't talk about that because that's the climax. <laughs> we actually were, we actually were first forced to edit that down a little bit. Probably good, but. Um, yeah, at a certain point, Tom is just done with the bullshit. He's just, he's, he's done. You know, it's yeah. one of the lines that, that, that was mine, and I don't even know if it made it in the final book, because I haven't read the final book yet, is what part of special air service was unclear? Yeah, that's in there. <laughs> yeah, I just read it. Um, so... Backtrack a little bit on the technology, if you will, um, which I found really interesting was the the short uh, exposition on uh, GPS and what happens to GPS and uh, why they why they couldn't rely on it, but it, it was still sort of there. So uh, in John's uh, universe, GPS is still available uh, to and as are the. Uh, the satellites that transmit emergency position location for um, lifeboats and so forth. And in, in the real world, um, satellites uh, move, adjust in orbit, whether you want them to or not. They're affected by gravitational um, uh, attraction from other things besides just the Earth. And so because they work on a very precise uh, measurement of time, when they depart from their um, what I'm going to characterize as their orbit, it's a very rough word, proper term is ephemeris, uh, the human operators at one of the master ground stations has to apply a correction to keep the answer that's solved by the uh, the algorithm on board the, uh, the satellite and reporting to the receiver, which is the thing you hold in your hand or have in your car, uh, it, and it measures that time so precisely it can tell you exactly where you are, but it needs multiple satellites. And if the satellites aren't getting updated, then at some point they're going to degrade. Um, some lower quality GPS receivers really rely on having several accurate satellites that are in what I'm going to call view within line of sight in order to give you a decent fix or your position. Um, military grade and some more expensive consumer or all characterizes um, um, a factory grade, if you will you know, for, for working ships and working airplanes, have access to somewhat more sophisticated ways of manipulating the signal and giving you a reasonable fix. Um, in this novel, we find out that the GPS is working sort of, but they're not, one of the problems with a commercial grade receiver, what you would get, you know, from the local hardware store, from Radio Shack, is that instead of telling you what the problem is, if it's not getting a decent answer out of a satellite, it just ignores the satellite. So you don't have, either you get a good answer or you get no answer. And that drives our uh, protagonists 
to relying more and more on paper maps, although they're still using GPS. But again, GPS is not going to be updated the way that, say, um, a very popular mapping service on your handheld phone is because there's no one telling it, no one updating that these roads are out or there's a traffic stop here or that there's a, a roadblock there. So just because you have a sense for where you are doesn't tell you how long it's going to take to get to where you want to be. Yeah, it was, it was, I I had never, you know, I thought it was really fascinating and handled adroitly and quickly the, uh, your explanation in the book. Um, there's a lot of just cool tech things that you have to consider when you're writing a book like this, right? There is. Um, I, I cheated. So, uh, first, I had John to consult with, and second, I did, you know, I do this professionally, so uh, on the, on the unclass side, uh, I've had a lot of exposure to sort of the what of around corporate and um, national level resilience and you know, we we continue to become more and more invested in so much of our technology in almost every application on precise geolocation and that's one of the easiest things to deny us because the the um, the satellites that give us this capability are relatively few in number less than 40 or so satellites in the highly uh, observable and well understood orbits uh, that are easy, relatively speaking, to interdict for a peer or near peer level nation. And uh, you don't have to destroy the satellite or actually physically damage it in terms of like a kinetic strike in order to keep it from working at the peak of uh, efficiency that's required to give you that nice precise location. So it's an interesting, an interesting question. Uh, I don't want to digress here, but there's some interesting ideas evolving now about how to replace. You know, what does the next generation of GPS constellation look like? Does it look like 30 or 40 really big, expensive satellites, or does it look like thousands of smaller ones, so, so large in number that you can't efficiently degrade um, precise geolocation capabilities fast enough to get a, a jump on the on your target, wherever the target might be? That, that's, remember, this book um, happens in the early 20-teens. Sorry, go ahead. Back to you, John. Well, 2012. Actually, I think yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, when I was looking at GPS, because GPS was very important um, from the point of view of the original four books, because you had a large number of boats at sea, and at sea you've got one or two choices. You've got three choices. Um, you have what's called Loran, which is a system that takes uh, ground stations that are transmitting. Signal, and it it triangulates the signal. And says, okay, you're you're approximately here. The Loran never back. Um, you have uh, uh, traditional celestial navigation, which only works if you've got relatively deep sky, um, and requires a certain amount of math skill and knowledge of specifically of spherical geometry. Um, or you've got GPS. And so I did a hand wavium that GPS still worked. Because the alternatives were that you had a whole bunch of boats that never rendezvous, would never have any, any freaking idea where they were, um, you could not tell anybody else. They found a boat that they needed help clearing. Um, they couldn't call somebody else to pay with help because nobody would know where they were. So I did a hand wavium with GPS still worked. Um, Afterwards, I, I talked to some people. Uh, Mike is much more knowledgeable about the scope than I am. Um, but uh, I'm knowledgeable about some stuff. Um, uh, I, I just had to I just had to avoid. It. Um, military grade is certainly going to stay up for quite a long time, and it's because I did a hand wave you instead of it being based on certain things they could shift other. Um, and so there was one base that was still functioning. And I had it that that base was what was keeping the GPS on. Um, that does not actually work. But what does work is uh, other uh, groups that survive can collaborate with that base to keep the GPS on. Um, so how GPS is working is, first of all, it's hand-waving. And second, there's 
distinct possibility that even in something this severe, there would be multiple groups working who were survivors of GBF functioning because it was so important to so many people. That's it. Yeah. Well, uh, it just great, plays into the... There's a great article on that. Go ahead. This plays into the plot, right? The other thing about it is that back in uh, 2003, I think it was, uh, there was a Blue Ribbon Commission panel on uh, space war and space defense and et cetera. And it was, a, it was chaired by Rumsfeld. Um, he wasn't on it all the time, but it was you know, very serious Pentagon people and civilian people looking at very serious questions about space, near, near space, satellites, uh, rockets. Anti satellite folks, et cetera, et cetera. And they had virtually completed the whole thing. Lieutenant Colonel kind of, you know, said, Hey, you know, we haven't really asked anybody who does science fiction about this. And so they said, Well, you know, let's let's see if we can find if you can find some science fiction authors to give a few comments just before he finished the whole thing. You know, before he finished the whole thing, that'd be great. Go ahead, go go take a look at it, Colonel. And so the colonel contacted uh, Bain Book, because uh, he was a fan. And uh, Bain had me, David Drake, um, an author whose name I can't forget, and he wrote like one or two books with Bain. He hasn't been around. I think uh, Van, uh, the other, another one I think was uh, Van, you know who I'm talking about, David Drake. Oh, Mark Van Name, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think Mark Van Name was in on this, but I know it was me and Drake. The other author who read a couple of books. Weird. Yeah, was that together? Yeah, I know who it is. It's the anyway. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, he'd written a book about hackers save the planet. Uh, anyway, each of us wrote up a little write up about what we were looking at, and my whole thing was uh, we're totally dependent on GPS, and GPS is easy as hell to use. Uh, and I went through like five or six scenarios whereby you don't even have to hit it. Um, there's, there's ways to do fairly good EMPs that will damage. Um, and we got back from the, uh, from the colonel. Thank you for all of your input. Uh, we looked at it and they've decided that they're going to essentially restart the blue ribbon panel. We had, uh, <laughs> uh, so I've been touching around the edges of this for a while. The fact that GPS is a uh, is not entirely reliable plays into the plot because um, this leads Tom to write things down on maps. Well, one of those maps uh, falls into the hands of Harlan Green, right? Yeah, the uh, Tom and his uh, his group of stalwarts and some not so stalwarts are making their way westward towards Site Blue. Um, like you do, it's taking much longer than they had expected in their most pessimistic estimates. And uh, among the things that they, they need, um, most of all what they need are, is information uh, and, and more maps as they go. But they have a what I'll call a, a meeting engagement with one of the uh, outriding patrols of the gleaners, so-called because they, you know, they pick over what's left after the fall of civilization and, and keep what's worth keeping. And uh, they they've been very careful not to rely on on digital maps. I mean, and for that matter, digital maps are fine. They can be very helpful. They, you can do some extraordinary things with network communications and passing details back and forth. But when it comes to basic land navigation, especially um, um, large scale, in other words, small detailed areas, paper maps or physical maps are really really helpful, which is why they're still in use. Uh, they don't need batteries. Uh, they're easy to mark up, et cetera. But that means that if you lose one and you've marked things on it, important things like where you're going next and what you're going to find there, uh, then you've literally <laughs> left a map for the bad guys to follow up. And that becomes quite a problem and drives a lot of the action in the second half of the book because Green, who's no slouch, immediately understands what he's looking at. And you're not just looking at well, here's some unexpected places where there's caches of valuable items. No, worse than that, 
wait a second, I've got a second organized group that has a plan, that has some skills, maybe a lot of skills, that is in more than one place and has competing goals. Okay, this cannot be allowed to persist. And so uh, quite apart from the the uh, the sting to both sides of that of that military or pseudo military paramilitary engagement, now you have a uh, green who has definitely has the upper hand in almost every category of uh, in the correlation of force, and he now has it in his best interest to find these folks that he ran into or that his leaners ran into and um, get them off the playing board. He knows exactly where they're going. Or at least he knows pretty much exactly what the plan is. He into he he analyzes it and figures it out. Uh, Green has built up a much larger force, uh, uh, but towards the end of the book, what becomes clear is while Green is perfectly capable, some of his force is fairly capable. Uh, it's it's a large force, but it's not a capable. Uh, and so towards the end of the book. This large force runs into capability, um, and it shows the value of capability over, um, especially when you start talking about pissing off electric. Yeah, and and the value of of grit and being good instead of evil and things like that. Yes. So, yeah, they're altruistic, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. but but a big aspect of it is. Uh, you know, the the final the, the two the big clash at the end of the book involves you know a, a group that is a believer in freedom and all of that stuff, and which is important from the point of view of morale, um, versus uh, a sort of driven conscript group. Um, but more importantly than that, it involves a lot of people who have a lot of background in. Uh, tax, and it also involves a lot of people who are very, very smart and have thought the situation out. Um, and it especially involves uh, some electrical engineers and electricians who have got access to a 30, 000, a, a 30 megawatt power plant. Um, it, I, some of the some of the stuff got edited, so I don't know exactly what the state of the law did. Um, but uh, the thing about it is that the electrical industry is a constant source of, of industrial act, uh, deadly industrial act. And so any electrician, any electrical engineer with any experience whatsoever has an enormous list of ways that they know of people have died. And so if you have a situation where you, you have a large number of people who have to die, the person to go to is an electrical engineer because they'll just say, well, give me enough electricity and I can build it one. Um, <laughs> yeah, John, one, one of the great quotes that John put in there is uh, one of the operators at this electrical plant uh, is warning new arrivals away from large swaths of land around the dam. And they go, "What's I mean, have you mined it? Are there explosives? And she says, no, it's, it's one big series of industrial accidents waiting to happen. You know, besides, I'm, I'm an engineer with 30 megawatts of power. Explosives would be redundant. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you guys so much. We'll talk. Bye. That was part one of a two-part interview with John Ringo and Mike Massa, authors of River of Night. Part two will be available next time on the podcast. Now we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa, book one in the saga of the Forgotten Warrior. After the War of the Gods, the demons were cast out and fell to the world. Mankind was nearly eradicated by the seemingly unstoppable beasts. Until the gods sent the great hero Ram Rowan to save them, he united the tribes, gave them magic, and drove the demons into the sea. 
But as centuries passed, the descendants of the great hero grew in number and power. They became tyrannical and cruel, and their religion nothing but an excuse for greed. The people rose up, and the surviving royalty and their priests were made castless, condemned to live as untouchables. The age of law had begun. Ashok Vidal has been chosen by a powerful ancient weapon to be its bearer. He is a protector, a member of an ancient military order of roving law enforcers. No one is more merciless in rooting out those who secretly practice the old ways as Ashok. But Ashok isn't who he thinks he is. And when he finds himself on the wrong side of the law, the consequences lead to rebellion, war, and perhaps transformation. Now here is the latest entry in Larry Correa's Son of the Black Sword. Chapter 32 Ashok spent a few days down in the dark hole. It suited his mood. His quarters were a hidden compartment on the barge. It had been cleverly designed by criminals for smuggling goods and people. There was a trap door that opened directly into the river, for drinking, washing, and dumping waste, and plenty of air holes for just enough light to see by. Ashok wondered how many lawbreakers had escaped him over the years because of his hesitancy to go onto the water. It wasn't as if protectors didn't know river traffic existed. It was vital for trade, but it was so distasteful that he'd always thought of it as business best left to the castless. The constant rocking still made him uncomfortable, but he was used to it by now. The wounds from the arrows had already healed. The poison had been purged from his system. He could have gone out into the daylight, but Ashok was content to stay in the hidden room, alone. Mostly. Keita, the so-called keeper of names, had paid him a few visits. He'd spout some nonsense about praying for the forgotten's blessings and mad prophecies, but Ashok ignored him until he went away. The woman brought him food consisting of rice and fish, he was castless, so it was appropriate fare. But he gagged whenever he tried to put the ocean garbage in his mouth and ended up picking the fish out. After the first few times, she'd quit bringing him that unclean filth. Other than that, the woman seemed content not to talk. He'd only learned her name, Thera, because of Keita's continual babblings. The barge was a large one, heavy with cargo, and he only knew the rest of the crew by the sound of their never-ending songs. The castlers avoided him. Whether out of fear or because they'd been ordered to, Ashok didn't know or care. Days and nights bled together. Ashok didn't know how long he'd been on the river. It was like he'd traded one prison cell for another, only this one was humid and mobile. He had orders straight from the chief judge, that he was to make his way to Akashan. But the barge was heading south, deeper into the interior, so even by sitting here, he was still doing as he was told. The law was still being upheld. It was a strange thing, upholding the law by breaking it. One night, someone opened the secret door and poked their head in. In the dark, he could barely tell it was the woman, Thera. He still didn't know what she looked like. Come with me. He'd been ordered to obey the false prophet, not every petty criminal. No. Fine, you smug bastard. We're landing soon. Stay down here and let the warriors find you for all I care. She climbed back up the ladder. Oceans. Ashok waited a moment and then followed her. It was the first time he'd been outside since being pulled from the river. The night air was crisp, and it felt good to fill his lungs with something that didn't stink of mold. Ashok glanced around. Lanterns were mounted on each corner of the barge, both to light their way and also so other barges could see them. The castless were still poling, though there was a stutter in their rhythm as some of them spotted him and stopped to stare. There were lights on both sides of them, small villages along the banks. The river was very wide here, which meant they had to be close to Red Lake. 
He'd crossed plenty of rivers in his life, but it was a little uncomfortable being on a few pieces of lashed-together timber in the middle of so much water. He couldn't help but reach for his sword to confirm that it was still there. Easy there, protector. There's no demons below us. We're a long ways from the sea now, Thera said. I know where we are. She was hunched over, rummaging through a crate. Then you know we're getting off soon. No locks into Thou lands, and you can't hardly pole a barge up waterfalls. From here on, we ride, but we won't get anywhere with you looking like that. The only clothing he had left was a burned, blood-stained pair of prison-issued pants. I'm castless. This is sufficient. Not carrying that sword around, it's not. Keita joined them. The Keeper of Names leaned on the railing next to Ashok, seemingly unafraid of falling into the river. If we're to make it to Akashan safely, you'll need to blend in. Castless can't have weapons, and they can't freely cross house borders. Not to mention, you'll get frostbite where we're going. I'll be fine, Keeper. The tallest mountains of Thau were hills compared to the Order's training grounds in Devacula, and really, who cared if an untouchable froze his nose off? No, you won't. We need you to avoid notice, Ashok. Can you do that for us, please? In truth, he had no more desire for conflict either. Ashok nodded. All right. I have some things you can wear, Thera said as she shifted through the contents of the crate. You're about the same size as this barge's last overseer. What happened to him? One of your order suspected him of smuggling and stabbed him in the heart. Was he guilty? Yes, but that's besides the point. Here you go. Thera pulled out a bundle of clothing and handed it over. It was the first time he'd ever seen her in the light. Large, dark eyes and a face that was a bit too round to be considered beautiful among the first cast, but she was still rather attractive. For a criminal. Don't put them on yet. You'll need to look castless until I get our new papers. Ashok took the clothes from her. They felt sturdy and well made. He held the long coat up to the torchlight. The canvas sleeves bore a green worker's insignia, specifically that of the merchant subcast. I can't wear this. Sure you can. Thera touched the same insignia on her sleeve. For a woman, Thera's clothing was remarkably drab in color and cut. I've got a man in Apura who can forge traveling papers to match and even say you're authorized to carry a sword to defend yourself from highwaymen. Easier than trying to hide that thing, and sheathed, it looks normal enough. I figure if you have to pull that evil creation out for the world to see, we've got worse problems than getting caught with fake documents. Fake documents. Ashok trailed off. Forging an arbiter's stamp was punishable by death. It took all of his self-control not to strike her down on the spot. Keita reached out to place a calming hand on Ashok's arm, but then he saw the dark look on his face and must have thought better of it. Logically, Ashok knew that he was no longer of status and that he and Keita were equal nobodies, but he wasn't used to being touched. That was another entry in the complete audiobook serialization of Son of the Black Sword by Larry Correa. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Tesla coil tower on Mount Elbert in Colorado. Useful for zapping any HR department lackey who uses diversity and inclusion talk as an excuse for shutting up troublesome geniuses with retro bikini models on their shirts but whose cockamamie ideas for solving logistics just might work and save the world in the process. Plus, thanks and plaudits for John Ringo and Mike Massa, authors of River of Night. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 